Uh, I want to welcome everyone to this uh, discussion. This is a continuation of the presentation we started last month on uterine mesenchymal tumors. And uh, of course, as always, if you have questions, uh, just type them in the chat or uh, raise your hand and, and I will be happy to share on those. I'm going to cover today uh, endo, uh, endometrial stromal tumors, and uh, that's uh, as well as PCOMA and uh, one or two other minor uh, lesions. Uh, it looks as though we also have uh, Dr. Ngai from uh, Da Nang Oncology Hospital. We're glad you could be with us today. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and start my uh, sharing my screen uh, here. And uh, uh, let's see, there we go. Share the right view. So everyone can see my screen. That's good. So uh, we'll start off with uh, perivascular epithelioid cell tumors. So these are sometimes nicknamed PECOMA or P yeah, P E C O M A. These are not very common. Um, and as you know, they derive from the perivascular epithelial cells, epithelioid cells. Um, and this is a particularly a prom problem in patients with tuberous sclerosis, which I don't believe is very common in Asian patients. Uh, but it's still a very interesting lesion to understand uh, because occasionally it, it can still occur there and you'll be you'll be confused because it's a quite a confusing uh, entity uh, if you aren't aware of it uh, or you don't think about it. <clears throat> it can look a lot like other sarcomas. Uh, it can sometimes look a little bit like carcinoma because these are very epithelioid cells and sometimes they're sort of nested um, and so forth. And the capillary network can look a little bit like uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma. But uh, the, the clue here is really um, what we call biphenotypic um, differentiation, meaning that these cells have uh, HMB45, um, Oops. Yeah, let me just uh, go back here and uh, go to the meeting control so I can activate the uh, um, live transcript. I'd like you to be able to see what I'm saying here. Um, here we go. Okay, so um, these cells have melanocytic markers like HMB45, melan A, MITF, S100, as well as some uh, smooth muscle markers, either cathepsin K, calponin, desmin, most commonly, smooth muscle actin occasionally. And then these other markers, uh, uh, CD117 is probably an indication of uh, mutation rather than uh, other sorts of things. Uh, these also uh, occasionally have uh, uh, TFE3 June fu fusions. If we're just working on histology and we know that we have sort of mus muscle and melanocytic differentiation, um, we will define malignancy as having two or more of these features, larger size, greater than five centimeters, uh, an infiltrated border, high-grade nuclei or cellularity, necrosis, and uh, really any degree of uh, mitotic activity, more than one per 50 high power fields. Uh, so that's not very many. Um, and then any sort of lymphovascular invasion. Uh, this is important because these are tumors which do have a tendency to recur um, after several years. Uh, we've seen a few recurrences in our practice at 
five, six, seven years after initial diagnosis. So what do these things look like? Well, uh, sometimes they have this very clear cytoplasm, as you can see here, uh, sort of pallor to the cells. Uh, and here they're stained with HMB45. Um, but they also can have this more nested epithelioid pattern that you see here. So this looks maybe a little neuroendocrine-like or maybe a little uh, paraganglioma-like. Notice the mitotic figure here. Uh, this would almost certainly be a, a malignant lesion. Um, even though the, the degree of cytologic atypia is low, Here's another example. Here's a more corded pattern. Um, so this anastomosing cords of cells, that's not a usual feature that we think of with smooth muscle tumors, but might be more something you think about um, sex cord tumors or carcinomas and so forth. So you have to be uh, quite aware of uh, diverse possibilities and do the stain uh, at least one or two muscle and melanocytic markers uh, to make this diagnosis. Necrosis, here you can see uh, it should be a tip off again. Um, and, you know, the differential will be include many things like, uh, you know, epithelioid, smooth muscle tumors, and so forth. Now, uh, not too long ago, uh, one of the uh, publications uh, on this topic uh, put out this nice graphic to sort of illustrate um, what the various cytogenetic uh, abnormalities might be. Um, and the two most frequent ones are tuberous sclerosis complex alterations. Now, this is not a a readily available uh, test. So this is not something that we do or you can do very easily. Um, and it's not available in the commercial laboratory. So uh, I, this is uh, for classification and hopeful thinking for the future, but right now it's not the state of the art. TFE3 fusions, perhaps we can do with uh, fish testing or sometimes with immunohistochemistry in which case we would say a, a TFE3 translocation associated PCOMA. Now, if we don't have that uh, and we have a significant amount of uh, HMB45, uh, we would say favor PCOMA. Um, if we don't have any of these things and we don't have smooth muscle alterations like TP53 or RB1, et cetera, we might just be descriptive and suggest the possibility of PCOMA in the differential uh, to alert them to appropriate follow-up. Because in, there's no specific therapy for this at present aside from surgery, um, and uh, the uh, chemotherapeutic agents would be just very generic. So uh, that's just, a kind of, I think, kind of helpful way to think about it. All right, well, let's go on to endometrial stromal tumors. And uh, these, of course, begin with the endometrial stromal nodule. Uh, and uh, you, some of you may have seen an earlier video that I did on this topic uh, with this uh, stromal nodule here with just a little bit of, uh, you know, slight infiltration. Uh, these nodules, these are low-grade tumors, uh, but we can't distinguish low-grade stromal sarcoma and stromal nodule um, in the setting of a fragmented curatage specimen. So if you see this kind of cellularity in a, in a curatage, you should just say stromal neoplasm, low grade, um, and await the surgical resection. If you get it as a resection, then it will be usually well circumscribed, perhaps with a little bit of in, infiltration uh, from other on the margins. Um, and if it's a little bit more than that, single mass, that's been termed endometrial stromal tumor with limited invasion. It's kind of a borderline endometrial stromal tumor, essentially. Um, and then the vascular network is going to be similar to what we see in other uh, endometrial stromal sarcomas, fairly low mitotic rate usually. And if 
indeed resected completely, this usually has a good prognosis. Although we have seen um, one uh, recurrence in a patient whose uh, um, uh, ovaries were uh, remained intact and uh, had that uh, hormonal uh, stimulation. So here's kind of what they look like, uh, fairly sharply circumscribed here, a little bit gelatinous, distinct from the myometrium over here. Um, and here you see increased cellularity, a few larger vessels, but most prominently is the small vascular network that you can barely make out here. Um, limited infiltration like this in one or two foci you could call um, you know, limited stromal invasion or borderline uh, sort of tumor. And if you do immunohistochemistry, CD10 will be positive as you see here. Uh, smooth muscle actin uh, will be positive in the muscle, but not usually in this, this in Desmond, excuse me, this is Desmond, uh, but not in the uh, uh, stromal tumor. So uh, these are usually uh, arise in uh, premenopausal women. Uh, and if they present with vaginal bleeding, that's usually a good sign. If they present with a pelvic mass, that usually means more okay. advanced stage. Um, well, it might be. Okay. So here's a higher magnification view. You can see uh, sometimes oh, yeah, vasculature yeah. is uh, very... Wow. No, no, bad, bad. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, someone hasn't muted, so I'm getting additional uh, uh, noise. Um, and, and here you see the prominent vasculature here. Notice that the cells are fairly small and compact. They're not spindled, particularly. They're sort of more polygonal. And so uh, it doesn't look like a uh, smooth muscle tumor the majority of the time. Uh, we can get these uh, sort of uh, um, hyaline plaques uh, at times, stromal macrophages. And if it's a premenopausal patient who is pregnant, uh, you may even see a sort of decidual type change uh, in these cells where you get abundant cytoplasm and lower cellularity. Additionally, we can also see a myxoid change in this tumor. Now, you remember last time we talked about myxoid lyomyomas and myxoid lyomyosarcoma. Well, this is also in the differential for those tumors, uh, but immunohistochemistry would be negative for smooth muscle markers, positive for CD10 or other stromal markers in this tumor, which would help you. Occasionally, you'll get smooth muscle differentiation, which is what you're seeing here. Here's the stromal sarcoma, sort of nodules projecting into the muscle, and then some additional smooth muscle differentiation in the tumor here, which is supposedly is illustrated here. And you can see these are more spindle-shaped cells compared to these polygonal cells on the left. And again, muscle markers might show a few areas of Desmond positivity in these tumors if they have that smooth muscle differentiation. That's okay, you can see that, but the majority of the tumor should not be positive for Desmond. This would be usually a fairly localized uh, feature. So uh, mentioned uh, immunohistochemistry, uh, these are usually CD10 positive. They can also be positive with WT1 and beta catenin, um, whereas uh, lyomyomas would not be uh, positive in that case. Sometimes you'll get cyto cytokeratin and other uh, hormone markers, things of that sort. Um, CD117 maybe, um, those are also possibilities as well. These usually are not mutated with P53. And in the low-grade tumors, we have a fairly characteristic fusion gene uh, that we've begun to use more frequently now, a JAS f one SUS12 gene fusion in about three quarters of cases. And I suspect that this will become fairly standard in defining the low-grade uh, sarcomas. Uh, 
uh, because the uh, the other 25% may actually be uh, a different mutation that is usually associated with a worse prognosis, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. So how do we distinguish endometrial stromal sarcoma from stromal nodule? Well, they have most of the things in common. They also have this fusion gene in, in common. So the only differentiation is really the single focus with stromal nodule and more extensive invasion with stromal sarcoma. Uh, otherwise, they are really pretty much identical. Now, occasionally, these tumors can have other elements in them. Uh, this is an example where you have little sex cord-like uh, differentiation in a few foci. And you can see here the surrounding smooth muscle and the characteristic uh, pushing uh, nodular invasion. We can also occasionally get glandular elements that get pulled along with this. Uh, this is not uh, adenomyosis. This is actually the tumor that's invading lymphatic space and has included some glandular elements that just got entrapped into the sarcoma and were pulled along. These are not growing in the same way that an adenosarcoma would. Uh, and so you don't have that frond-like growth that would characterize adenosarcoma. So uh, we can see that the differential is quite uh, broad. Uh, we've mentioned that it's in, almost impossible to distinguish from stromal nodule. Uh, but the other things that you need to consider and rule out would include adenomyosis with sparse glands. This can look a little bit infiltrative, but doesn't have the, the fusion gene. It doesn't have uh, any degree of mitotic activity. Adenosarcoma, usually that glandular component is going to define that. Malignant mixed mullerian tumor or carcinosarcoma is going to have high-grade stromal atypia, not something that we see in endometrial stromal sarcoma. Um, adenomyosis or endometriosis, these are more benign lesions. And then some of the smooth muscle tumors, leiomyosarcoma, and so forth. So. Um, you can see that there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, but in general, this is not a difficult diagnosis to make if you uh, approach it with uh, a good tissue and uh, appropriate markers. How do these behave? Well, uh, local regional spread to the adnexi, occasionally to the lymph nodes. Uh, at a later stage, you can get pulmonary metastasis and then uh, years later, you can have local pelvic recurrences and so forth. Um, so the differentiation and stage are the important features. And uh, this Jazz F1 SUS12 mutation is uh, generally the lower grade tumor. So one of the things that's in the differential is uh, atypical adenomyoma, um, which can also cause uh, vaginal bleeding and kind of the uh, mid-adult life, early premenopausal uh, state. Um, these are usually solitary lesions, but sometimes they can appear to be invasive, and sometimes the glands can be quite uh, complex. Um, there is a combination, however, of cytologic uh, and architectural atypia, which can include necrosis in the squamous morules, uh, occasional crib reform architecture and the glandular features, and most frequently uh, atypia in the myofibroblast cells, uh, which will also have mitoses. In general, the nuclear atypia in the epithelial component should be very mild or minimal. So here's a gross example, polypoid lesion. Now, sometimes these can extend through the cervical os and present as a cervical mass. So you need to include this in the broad differential of, of lesions. And here you can see you have a glandular component, but you have this very myomatous stroma. It's not a, uh, an endometrial type stroma. It's a more muscle type of stroma. 
more cytoplasm, pinker cells. And I think over here you can see there's a degree of stromal atypia in some of these cells. Here's the necrosis that the squamous morules can have. Uh, and occasionally, as I mentioned, you can have cribriform architecture. But notice here that these cells are small. The nuclei are generally round. They're not elongated or highly crowded. Uh, although the NC ratio is high, it's not uh, a high degree of anaplasia or atypia. You don't see a variation in size of the nuclei of greater than you know, two to one. Usually malignant cells have a three or four to one uh, range of uh, difference between uh, the cells. Okay, so let's uh, move on to high grade endometrial stromal sarcomas. Um, these uh, again have a small round cells that have maybe a low grade fibromyxoid component. Um, and they have a different mutation. The YWHAE, nut M2, uh, A or B uh, fusion uh, is a different prognostic uh, marker uh, from the JAZZ uh, F1 uh, SUS12 mutation. Now, there are a couple of other versions of this high grade sarcoma uh, of endometrial stroma which have different um, molecular biologic uh, events. Um, and so I'm just educating you about these. I don't expect that you will be able to apply them, but just so that you're aware that there's a mixture of uh, tumors in this, in this uh, category. So this uh, ZC3H7B B-Core uh, fusion uh, is uh, one uh, additional uh, marker. And then in addition, there can be uh, a B-core related sarcoma that has uh, internal tandem duplication. Um, and these vary a little bit in terms of the uh, amount of uh, fibromyxoid low-grade tumor that's present. This will generally have a little bit more of it. Uh, this is a little bit more spindle shaped cells in this particular tumor. Uh, and this uh, BCOR with the internal tandem duplication has no low grade component. Now, in addition, there are other high grade sarcomas that we just can't classify. Uh, and there they're may or may not have an associated low grade component. So this becomes a, a bit of a mixture of tumor types that we're beginning to sort out. And you can see here some of the uh, testing that may help with that. Now, this probably becomes important later down the road because prognosis will be different, as well as the possibility of B-Core targeting therapies uh, are beginning to become available. Fortunately, these are very rare. They're rarer than rare, um, but they can occur over a broad age range. Um, if the patient has lymph node mets and it's a high-grade sarcoma, that's usually this uh, fusion B-core uh, 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 tumor. Um, the prognosis, not as good as low-grade, uh, but there are some long-term survivors, so it's not uh, impossible. So let's talk a little bit more about this YWHAE nut M2 uh, sar sarcoma. Um, this has been described as having destructive myometrial invasion with sort of tongues of tumor, uh, quite cellular, and having a nested or corded pattern. Um, similar, remember we talked about this, picoma having occasionally a corded pattern. So that would be in the differential here as well. Um, they can have a very uh, prominent uh, capillary net network, like the low-grade tumors, um, and sometimes a pseudoglandular appearance. Um, so what does it look like? Well, here's one example. As you can see, these are not 
highly anaplastic tumors. You can see the vascular network here, a little bit more prominent than with low grade. Um, but it could be difficult to distinguish from low grade. You usually will have maybe a little bit more mitotic activity in some of these tumors as well. Here's a higher magnification, sort of showing a little bit of sort of pseudo rosette formation. You can see some of these pseudo rosettes. And obviously, if you saw that, you would need to think also about, you know, prim primitive neuroectodermal tumors or uh, Wilms tumor or other very uncommon tumors in the uh, uterus. So this uh, fusion B core stromal sarcoma also has a tongue like and broad front infiltration. Um, fairly uniform in terms of cellularity, uh, mixoid tissue sometimes, and these collagen plaques that we've talked about and seen in other locations can be seen with this tumor. Uh, the vasculature is a little bit more variable and may have some more dilated hemangiopericytoma-like uh, vessels as well. Uh, necrosis, lymphovascular invasion become common, and as we mentioned earlier, there's no low-grade endometrial stromal tumor in this uh, tumor. So here you see a little bit more of this uh, collagenous tissue, fascicular growth, a little bit of fibromyxoid tissue in the background, uh, variable amounts, um, a little bit more spindle-shaped, and there's nothing here that looks like low-grade stromal sarcoma. Here's another view of one of these. Uh, and this, I think, could be confused with a myxoid leiomyosarcoma. So you'd probably use muscle markers on this to exclude that. Um, <clears throat> these tumors often will be cyclin D1 positive. And if you're able to do B-core immunohistochemistry, that would also be positive in about half of the cases should be CD10 positive still, however. Here's another area, <clears throat> a little bit more, more mixoid, more spindly, and notice that it's not highly anaplastic. There's not high-grade atypia all the time in this lesion, but it's still considered a high-grade sarcoma. So what about the other B core tumor, the one with internal tandem duplication? Uh, again, this has a similar pattern of invasion. It can have fascicular or diffuse growth. It can have a variable collagenous or mixoid background, so it can look just like the uh, uh, previous one, small vessels and so forth. So it, morphologically, this is the same description uh, as the previous tumor we just talked about. Um, Here's a, a, a picture, you know, I haven't seen one of these. This is from a textbook uh, source. You've got collagenous plaques and this fairly cellular tissue uh, with a bit of, uh, you know, small intermediate sized cells, not again, highly anaplastic, but certainly cellular enough to be considered high grade. <clears throat> Here's some more myxoid areas again in this uh, lesion with the internal tandem duplication, uh, as you see. So what do we do for a high-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma? So we should, of course, do CD10 and, and hormone markers. Uh, this may both be useful in identifying lineage and uh, therapy may be uh, useful using the hormone markers. <clears throat> they should be usually cyclin D1 positive. If you can do B-core, uh, that will help steer you towards uh, the uh, one of the B-core related lesions. Uh, ruling out other lesions uh, like rare, you know, GI stromal tumors, uh, neuroendocrine or, uh, you know, uh, Wilms types tumors, Ewing's types tumors, those sorts of things uh, could be uh, ruled out. Muscle markers. Um, in terms of therapy, uh, some people are recommending doing the, the, the TRK testing as potential clue that it might be amenable to uh, anti-NTREC uh, agents. 
but if you have it available, doing uh, genetic testing uh, would probably be the most specific way to arrive at a diagnosis in one of these uh, lesions. Otherwise, you may just end up saying this is a high-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma, not otherwise uh, differentiated or specified. <clears throat> so we'll go on to a less frequently encountered tumor, uterine tumor resembling ovarian sex cord stromal tumor. Uh, this also, again, is a fairly uh, uncommon tumor. Uh, but you, if you see very many GYN cases, you'll eventually come across uh, one or more of these. I've had a few in my career um, in, in general practice and uh, uh, one or two here at the University of Oklahoma. So these are usually circumscribed tumors. So you're not thinking high grade, um, you know, infiltrative tumors. And they're very interesting to look at because you see these um, sex cord like elements that are admixed with other stroma, whether it's endometrial type stroma or leiomyomatous type stroma or something like that. And because of this mixture of things, the immunohistochemistry can be quite uh, uh, quite varied. So you can have uh, epithelial stromal markers, you could have sex cord markers like calretinin, inhibin, so forth. Um, and some of these other uh, markers that are less frequently seen. So um, grossly, this is a couple of images. Here you see the tumor has a bit of a yellow hue to it. So you might even be thinking grossly a lipoleomyoma or uh, maybe a stromal nodule or something of that sort. Um, and it's generally circumscribed, but it's a little bit irregular in these lesions. Under the microscope, however, you'll see, you know, areas that like this that look like uh, Sertoli cells, or maybe even a paraganglioma-like uh, pattern. Um, you may see uh, tubules with uh, sort of lining uh, <clears throat> Sertoli-like cells uh, in the in the lesion, uh, and then occasionally you can even have rediform patterns like this. Uh, resembling the uh, reedy ovary. So uh, you can imagine how uh, interesting these tumors could be uh, with these varied features. Um, you can have, um, you know, steroid cells in these lesions, more typical tubules or uh, structures and so forth. Uh, so it's just a very, very interesting pattern of uh, histologies that can be seen with this ovarian tumor that looks like an ovarian, excuse me, a uterine tumor that looks like an ovarian sex cord stromal tumor. Now, sometimes these tumors can have a rhabdoid morphology. So here you see these very eosinophilic globules in some of the cells. Uh, and if you see that, uh, that raises uh, a couple of concerns. First off, if this is a prominent feature, in other words, a lot of this change, uh, that implies a tumor with a greater risk of recurrence um, and potentially also a different type of tumor because this uh, pattern has been associated with uh, some other um, uh, features. So what do we expect to see? We've mentioned the immunohistochemistry that can be variable with the sex cord stromal markers. Sometimes they may have epithelial or muscle markers, um, CD10 occasionally, P16 variably, hormone markers and so forth. Um, and there are a number of gene fusions. So here's a uh, beta catenin uh, fusion gene with GREB1. Uh, or with a different uh, partner, uh, and you see here a different partner with this one, and so forth. Um, you will not see the stromal sarcoma mar uh, fusion uh, or others, and we have not seen DICER1 or FOXL2 mut mutations, which we often do see in the ovarian sex cord stromal tumors. So uh, that would exclude uh, metastasis from an ovarian tumor. 
So what do we consider in the differential diagnosis? Well, it's really quite broad. Uh, carcinomas uh, with sex cord stromal-like growth. So some endometrial carcinomas can have this type pattern of growth. Those would usually have endometrial or endometrioid markers. Uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma, we've already mentioned that that can have sex cord-like elements. Uh, some smooth muscle tumors uh, can have sex cord stromal-like uh, lesions, as can adenosarcoma. Uh, but these should have more characteristic areas that are classically uh, either adenosarcoma or smooth muscle tumor. Um, the GREB1 rearranged sarcoma with sex core differentiation, uh, that's a, not a lesion that I'm familiar with, but it's listed in the textbooks. I think this is an evolving area. I will, however, mention that the SMARC-A4 deficient tumors um, this is a category where that rhabdoid morphology uh, could come into play. And so doing an INI1 uh, to see if you have SMARC-A4 deficient uh, features uh, would be worthwhile. Uh, and then there are any of a variety of other tumors that can have rhabdoid morphology, uh, Wilms tumor and so forth that, that can look like that. So uh, these are features to uh, bear in mind in the very uncommon cases. So here's a GREB1 rearranged uterine sarcoma. Uh, these can be quite variable, uh, you, but you can see how this would enter into the differential diagnosis and, and only be differentiated with uh, the uh, molecular testing. Here's a SMARC A4 deficient uterine sarcoma. Here you can see uh, quite nicely the rhabdoid features in many of these cells, uh, the rather prominent nucleoli in many of the uh, nuclei. Um, and uh, it looks a little bit more aggressive than uh, some of those other lesions we've been thinking about. Uh, this looks more clearly malignant, whereas usually the uterine tumor resembling ovarian sex cord tumor is not a, a malignant tumor. Well, uh, that uh, brings us to the end. Uh, I uh, express my gratitude to one of my teachers, uh, Bob Scully. Uh, who was a, a truly great human being, and I always, uh, I always liked going into his office because, uh, although he was very honored and distinguished from uh, the highest and most uh, esteemed universities, the only thing he had on his wall uh, that said who he was was his uh, certificate of graduation from a uh, middle school, a junior high school. So that to me was always. Uh, kind of one of those uh, interesting things uh, about that. Uh, and so we'll uh, stop the share at this point. Let's see here if I can figure out how to do that. Yeah, I'm still having trouble here. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, um, questions. What questions have come up as you've been listening or uh, as we've been talking? You can certainly feel free to type them into the chat or... Uh, um, okay, good question from Dr. Tuan. How can we differentiate between atypical polypoid adenomyoma and endometrial uh, adenocarcinoma grade one? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, the, there, are, there are two ways to, to do this that should help you. Uh, one is you should see that the lesion has a polypoid architecture with the atypical stromal cells. Uh, the, the myofibroblastic cells of the stroma are atypical. And low-grade endometrial uh, stromal, uh, low-grade endometrial adenocarcinoma can have associated stromal atypia or stromal proliferation, but it won't be very extensive. It'll be focal. Um, and so uh, that differential should not usually be a problem. Additionally, the cytology of the glandular elements, 
uh, will be lower grade. So even though the architecture in a typical polypoid adenomyoma may be a little complex with squamous morules and necrosis, the cytology of the glandular elements should be uh, very low grade. Good question. Any other questions? Well, it's great to have you uh, join me this e this morning. I, I know you have a busy day ahead, each of you working in uh, challenging uh, places. Uh, Dr. Lewis, I'm yeah, sorry, uh, Dr. Lan in Tay Hospital. Hello, she Dr. Lan. Good morning, uh, Professor Lewis. Uh, and um, I, uh, I uh, want to uh, uh, ask you about uh, atypical adenoma. I think uh, um, sometimes uh, when I see uh, many grip form adenoma parents, uh, it looks like malignant adenoma. Uh, and uh, Dr. Toan uh, and uh, me uh, wanted to know how about uh, what's now, what then marker can you uh, uh, distinguish this uh, from December CK7 and 5 RP63? So um, that's a good question. If uh, So there are two scenarios. If you have the uh, tissue from a curatage sample um, and you want to um, mark the stroma as um, I would mark the stroma with uh, smooth muscle markers, so Desmon uh, and, and Actin uh, or Caldesmon, because in a usual curatage sample, uh, you should ha shouldn't have the glands right next to the smooth muscle. Now, you might say, well, is it invasive? Is it invading into smooth muscle? But the truth is, is that the stroma in this tumor looks different from normal uh, uterine smooth muscle or endometrial stroma. It, it has an atypia to it that is um, characteristic. And so if you see that atypia in the stroma uh, on a curatage sample, you would you would I think lean towards this atypical polypoid adenomyoma. However, I will tell you that this is a very challenging diagnosis. And in most cases, um, you might sign it out in a way that uh, is non-committal. You might say atypical glandular and stromal neoplasm and say the differential includes low-grade endometrioid adenocarcinoma, atypical polypoid adenomyoma or something else, uh, maybe ad, uh, you know, low-grade uh, endometrial stromal, or excuse me, low-grade uh, carcinosarcoma. In that case, then they would need to do a hysterectomy. And that would then allow you to define the lesion as being an atypical polypoid adenomyoma more clearly or rule out the endometrial adenocarcinoma completely. Um, so th those, that, that's the real life experience is that many times those lesions end up going to hysterectomy before we can make a, a solid diagnosis, which is why I had that gross picture uh, that showed you the, uh, the full excision. Thank you so much. I think the truth here is that a hard case for you is a hard case for me. <laughs> any other questions? Dr. Ngai and Danang, anything from your group? Well, in that case, I don't see anyone else. I want to thank you so much for uh, being on the call with us. Uh, we will do this again next month. and. Uh, I'll accept suggestions for topics you'd like to see us uh, discuss. Um, I have a few ideas, but uh, you may have some other suggestions of what would be most useful for you. And uh, 
we will uh, look forward to being together again. Uh, it's always good to reconnect uh, with you uh, in, in Vietnam and uh, Phnom Penh and uh, uh, elsewhere. So have a good day. Thank you so much, Professor Hassel. Bye. Okay, xin chào. Xin chào.